Okay, so my name is Jeff Banster. I'm director of the Southwest Center, um, and I'm also an associate professor here in the School of Geography. And assisting me today is uh, Carlos Quintero, who is our outreach coordinator. Uh, thanks as well to Nicholas Wilson, assistant director of administrative operations, uh, and Carl Bauer, director of the School of Geography, Development and Environment, for all of your uh, support and assistance for this. And I also want to say, remember that we have a reception afterward right out here on the patio. Um, so please join us after the talk is over. Um, there'll be a nacho bar, um, I'm told, and uh, or at least that's what we ordered. Um, and, uh, uh, and, and Kitty Escalante is going to be uh, performing for us. And Kitty is the lead singer for the band uh, Astral Folk, um, and also the husband of Laurel Belante, who is another faculty member here in the School of Geography. So, so this is a very special occasion for sure. All right. We are truly honored today uh, to have with us Melanie Mele Martinez, uh, a native Tucsonense whose Sonoran Desert roots run nine generations deep. Few people can make this kind of claim of profound connection to place in the larger Tucson metro area, uh, whose population is now over a million, much less in a sunbelt state like Arizona with seven and a quarter million inhabitants and growing by the hour. If we look back nine generations, a stretch of 270 years or so, depending on how you run the numbers, um, and that's the kind of thing that demographers do, and we have one of those in the School of Geography, um, we would see, if we look back 270 years, we would see a Tucson or a Tucson precarious, precariously perched on the northern frontier of New Spain. Um, and by that time, the House of Bourbon had ruled Spain's American colonies for several decades and was driving hard to bring order to the relative chaos of Habsburg rule that had been in place since the time of Cortes. The semi-nomadic peoples of, the, of New Spain's northern frontier also weren't exactly rolling over for the conquest and settlement of their lands. They'd long since adapted to and reshaped their cultures around the horse, giving them agility and mobility needed to better defend their territories. By the mid to late 18th century then, the northern frontier of Nueva España was well marked by that singular quality of many frontier settings, that is, a hotly contested space in which no one group or set of interests is able to fully stabilize control and domination, at least not for long. So my introduction here is only going to last another 45 minutes, and then I'll turn it over to, to Mele. <laughs> um, so the Presidio, or fort, um, along with the mission, was a primary spatial expression of the Bourbon's vision of social control and defense. And on the 20th of August, 1775, Spanish soldiers, under the direction of an Irish mercenary, Hugo O'Connor, or Hugo O'Connor, selected a site for what would become the Presidio of San Agustin del Tucson, an area known today as the Presidio neighborhood of downtown Tucson. It was close to the banks of the Santa Cruz River, well positioned to, and well positioned to, uh, excuse me, well positioned for keeping an eye on human movement over the Tucson Basin. Uh, and then, so for millennia, this was, of course, uh, Tucson was a crossroads of people's cultures and ideas. So the the placing of the the presidio there was uh, obviously very strategic. And 1775, recall, was a year before the U.S. formally declared independence from England. So there's a lot happening here, and then of course a lot happening on the Eastern Seaboard and very much in between. So today we'll be learning from Mele, among other things, about quote, and this is from Mele's website, a family who moved across borders and between Rancho and Pueblo spaces to create a tiny food store in the Presidio. Tucson, among many other things, then has always been a crossroads. Mele Martinez is a first-generation University of Arizona graduate with a BA in Creative Writing, an MFA, and an MFA in Creative Nonfiction from Goucher College. She has received Fourth Genre's First Place Editor's Prize, the Tucson Festival of Books Second Place Literary Prize, and the Arts Foundation for, for Southern Arizona New Works Grant. She has been published in Fourth Genre, Bacopa Literary Review, Border Lord, Bearings Journal, the Contemporary Chicanex Writers Anthology, and in Telling Tongues, a Latin anthology on language experiences. And, mark this, 
Um, Mele has a forthcoming book with the University of Arizona Press, if I'm not mistaken, uh, called The Molino, a Memoir. Mele is a senior lecturer, lecturer uh, in the University of Arizona's writing program uh, and the project Adelante Testimonio Lead for the university. She teaches food writing and foundation writing courses with a focus on the borderlands. Mele, thanks so much for joining us. We're really glad to have you. Take it away. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Awesome. Thank you so much for that introduction. Um, I'm grateful to be here for many reasons. The first of all, for sure, to be able to share uh, some food stories with all of you. Um, food stories, obviously, are things that all of us have. Most of us have some really important Tucson food stories to share. And so I'm hoping this will be a place where we can start to share those stories together. Um, in preparing for this talk, uh, I have felt challenged to deliver a lecture rather than just tell some stories. Um, so I hope it's okay that I don't even categorize it as lecture, but more as a sto storytelling opportunity. Um, one of the things, of course, that I was inspired by in order to give this talk was to really consider the answer to, to a question, and that is, uh, what does my Tucson food map look like? Many of us have a mental map of how we think about Tucson, and then another layer of how that looks when we think about food specifically in this place. Um, so that's been the inspiration for me for this talk. I titled the lecture uh, Circling the Presidio, not just because I meant to invoke some kind of military takeover, but um, more because that's something that I've been doing for most of my life. Uh, as a kid and then in, as an adult um, on foot and by bike in my dad's uh, ugly old truck and also in my grandfather's very beautiful Chevy Impala, <laughs> I've been circling the Presidio for most of my life. I've been walking around the Presidio sometimes in my dance shoes and I've been carried around the Presidio sometimes on the city bus. I've wandered in circles around the place for, for many years, sometimes feeling a little lost, sometimes uh, searching. Sometimes I've been moving there just for the joy of movement. I know my family has always done this, and they continue to. In that sense, the presidio for my family has been the center of one part of our lives and has made us almost like the spokes of a very big wheel. My family's food was the heart of my Tucson. The Presidio was the home of my family's tamal and tortilla factory, a place called El Rapido. It was opened by my great-grandfather Aurelio Perez in 1933. My aunt Soledad took over the business in the 1950s and 60s and was one of the first female business owners in Tucson at that time. My father took over the business from her in the late 70s and I worked there for him. My brother and I both worked for him uh, until El Rapido closed, which was Christmas Eve in the year 2000. For the young people, the younger people in the room, it might be helpful for me to mention um, that my brother and I were uh, delivery drivers or delivery walkers or delivery bikers for my dad, um, but we were delivering before Uber Eats and before Grubhub existed. Um, by the time I was 11 years old, I was on my father's errand, and there was no GPS at that time to help me. The only thing I carried was a paper bag that usually held some Lucky Souls red chili burrito, maybe a cup of beans, and in my pocket I would hold uh, a small wad of cash and coins to make change. I'd carry this cachet in and out all around the Presidio, um, carefully making sure I didn't lose anything on my destination. And I was often guided uh, by my father's maps, his drawn maps of a very ever-changing downtown Tucson. My father's maps were drawn in blue ink, usually. 
and they were written on scraps of paper napkins and they were written on wax paper wrappers. My father's maps had lines like maps do. <laughs> they also had squiggly things <laughs> and arrows and they certainly had X's that marked the spot. But to be honest, um, they did not help me find where I was going. It was very hard for me, especially as a child, to think about abstractly about the layout of even a small portion of downtown Tucson. Um, to my imagination, the real world um, didn't look anything like his scribblings. It took time to begin to understand the depth and the space and the terrain of downtown Tucson. My father used to get very frustrated when I didn't understand his maps, and he usually resolved to just tell me, if you get lost, just look at the mountains. <laughs> the mountains. Sometimes when you're downtown Tucson, you can catch a glimpse of the mountains between the concrete and the glass. Even now, you should know the mountains are surrounding us. They show us that the Presidio and all the buildings that have been erected and torn down and erected again are just layers underneath something that is much, much bigger. They are helpful when you're lost but only if you know them pretty well. Only if their shapes and curves and burn are burned somewhere in your memory. I think if we close our eyes now, some of us can see the mountain line. We can see the wavy and peaked horizon, almost like a familiar radio signal. When I draw a mental map of Tucson, it's usually in the shape of a maze or overlapping circles. It's always surrounded by the mountain horizon, always. And there is always a path making its way through, and that is the Santa Cruz River. In the book Los Tucsonenses, author Thomas Sheridan explains that Tucson exists not because of gold, silver, or copper. It exists because of water. From the beginning, the river meant we could eat. Because of this provision, the place we call Tucson was founded on something different than what you might find in other cities or places of industry. Sheridan writes that the river meant, quote, a way of life geared towards subsistence rather than commercial exploitation and expansion. Unlike the mountains, the river comes and goes. And so to be Tucsonense means that someone, perhaps everyone in your Tucson ancestry was what Sheridan calls acutely aware of the narrow margin between survival and desolation. I think if you are a Tucson resident today, you might still be able to have that awareness. You might be able to see the margin of survival as a thin line drawn like the Santa Cruz River thin on a map. If you're privileged enough to have a stable shelter and food every day of your life, you may not be aware that the narrow margin exists here in the desert. I certainly was not. I had a home. I had a big family. And my father always had enough food, enough to feed an army. And even though I've never gone without, that awareness of our fragility in the desert did come to me eventually. Like so many businesses in downtown Tucson in the 90s, my family's nearly 70-year-old store came to an end. And sometimes the end of food can feel like the end of hope. Not because you're far away from that food, and not because you've chosen to give it up for a good reason, maybe for your health, but because it doesn't exist anymore. 
That kind of loss can make you think about survival and desolation in a very different way. You might lose hope about your city's future. Our sustainability between the mountains and the river may seem like a dream. You might feel that what was lost is lost, and you might not know how to argue for its return. I know I feel that way many times. I find that I can't draw a Tucson food map that matches up with the internet's GPS systems ever. When I navigate from maps on my phone, even if I did it today, I would get frustrated by all the things that are missing on those maps. There are ghosts on my mental maps. For me, it's not possible to draw a map without sketching a few of those apparitions, faded images. They linger over the land. They quietly haunt so many of the places that we still can see with our eyes, the places that are still marked on the map or the places that stand still against the horizon. The places that I'd like to talk to you today about are not an exhaustive list of the most important restaurants or markets or food stores in Tucson from the past all the way to the present. Nor is my list a top 10 in any way. If you want to know the best places in Tucson to eat tacos, you need to stick around longer than this lecture. <laughs> the places I've selected to discuss today only have one criterion. They hold meaning for me personally. I hope they are also familiar to you. Some of them uh, are long gone, just so you know. <laughs> and some of them, you could actually go to dinner tonight to this place. Um, but all of them help make up my, my Tucson food map. Here's our first one. It's Peyron Meat Market, Carneseria. The first one marks a historic move for many Tucsonenses, including my family. In the late 1800s and into the early 20th century, Tucson was tiny, but the ranchos outside the pueblo were vast. Eventually, there was a move from rancho to pueblo, and my great-grandfather, Rafael Peron, was part of that movement. He owned a ranch in the Sierrita Mountains, southwest of Tucson, and his cattle were butchered in his shop, pictured here on the, on the right. The address was 125 South Meyer Avenue, in the barrio that many Tucsonenses called La Calle. La Calle is one of the most important places in Tucson history. If you've been here long enough, you know that. It was written about extensively by a person who's very dear to me, uh, a Tucson historian, Dr. Lydia Otero, who explains how La Calle was destroyed during urban renewal. And I'm fairly certain the building um, that Rafael Peron had his carneceria in was also destroyed during that urban renewal. The carneceria was a gathering place in La Calle and a source for all kinds of ingredients that make up Tucson's palate even today. These included costillas, carne molida, chorizo, and salchichas. In the photo on the left, you'll see uh, a young girl in white. This is my great aunt, Aurelia Araneta. She also moved from the rancho to the city, and she eventually made a home very close to here, just across the street from the university. She was known for her uh, spectacular Christmas nacimiento, and her home at 1902 East Hawthorne Street was one of three that were featured in Tucson's Nacimiento Tour, an event that happened here in Tucson in the late 80s and early 90s. Visitors would come to see her property, which was entirely decorated. No inch was undecorated, inside and out. She decorated it with lights, miniature scenes of Christmas, general stores, desert settings, and angelic hosts were everywhere. 
people would come to see these while they sipped chocolate and maybe thought about eating some tamales for Christmas dinner. This connection between rancho and barrio is foundational in so many of our family dishes, even today. It's probably somewhere on your plate every day, and it's a perfect example of what we mean when we say the word food ways. This next one is uh, Jeff's Market, another important movement both during and after urban renewal was a flow that happened from the Presidio to the barrios that were west and south of downtown. My grandparents and my great-grandparents left the downtown center and they came to live in homes on the west side of the Santa Cruz River to a place called Barrio Menlo. Several businesses also moved from the Presidio to Menlo, including the Chinese market owned by Mr. Tom, which once stood across the street from my family's tamal and tortilla factory in the Presidio neighborhood. It was on the corner of Washington and Meyer, and then it moved to another corner in Menlo, on the corner of Grande in Congress. As a child, I remember going to Jeff's Market um, almost every day in the summer. It was a place where my father would sneak all forms of sugar and candy and uh, ice cream and whatever it was to both me and my brother, um, especially when my mom was not looking. The owner of Jeff's Market was from China, and he followed his father here to Tucson, arriving in 1940. A decade later, the market moved uh, to Menlo Park. By the time I was a teenager, Chinese grocers were a staple in my food life. Like my great-grandfather Aurelio, my father had a strong relationship with market owners who provided so much of the supply they need for their lunch counters. These grocers also provided us with jobs. My dad got me my first job outside of El Rapido, um, working at the 17th Street Farmer's Market, which was located on a loading dock um, for a uh, loading dock of another place called Tucson Fruit and Produce, which was a family-run produce um, place in the Industrial 800 block of East 17th Street. Never had I experienced such a wide variety of cultural foods as I did um, at my time at 17th Street Market. The market showed me things like blue crab, mung beans, every kind of fish sauce, Taiwanese puffed rice, European canned soup, kimchi, and dozens of different kinds of green vegetables that I still don't know how to pronounce correctly. Between attending the annual Tucson Meet Yourself, something that my family did every year, and working at the 17th Street Market, I learned that even if I didn't have the means to travel the world, parts of the world were here in Tucson and arriving all the time. Though the formation of the railroad, or I should say through the formation of the railroad um, in Tucson in 1880, meant the loss of an incredible way of life for Native and Mestizo people living along the Santa Cruz. It also meant access. It meant access to a larger world that continues to influence Tucson food. With the rail came the East, and the East was arriving at Tucson's doorstep. When it arrived, it arrived in many forms. One that's particularly poignant in my memory is a place called Bamboo Terrace. Has anybody been to Bamboo Terrace? Yes. <laughs> my father, like many from his generation, left the older barrios and moved west. And in the late 70s, my father, along with a small crew of his friends, actually constructed our family home. Um, they built it in the West Mountains near the end of 36th Street. Growing up out there, it's not that far, but we used to say out there, um, just outside the barrio, um, near the Sentinel Peak, um, did feel very remote to me sometimes. But there were a handful of family restaurants that we visited regularly. Places like Carichimaca, places like Mosaic Cafe, and of course, Bamboo Terrace. 
Opened in November of 1983, I hardly knew life at all on the west side without this place. <laughs> it was located near the corner of Ajo Way. It is located on the corner of Ajo Way and Mission Road. Mr. Lenny Mark is the second generation of owner of Bamboo Terrace. He and his wife Blanca of Guadalajara, Mexico, run the restaurant where my brother, my parents, and I came on random weeknights when we didn't feel like cooking. In the 80s and 90s, I lived in a home, like many Gen Xers, where both parents were working full-time and overtime, which meant that we didn't often have family meals together, especially during the week. It was usually every man for himself in my childhood home. But we loved going to Bamboo Terrace. My brother would drown his rice in soy sauce like soup. It was ridiculous. Um, my mother would make sure we ate vegetables. We could eat vegetables. And my father would load his plate over and over in our family style eating. We all sipped hot tea from those tiny teacups that as a kid, I just thought were the most amazing thing. I remember our long conversations and I remember bouts of laughter inside the comfort of that little strip mall Chinese restaurant. I remember other families there too. I remember them speaking Chinese, English, and Spanish, and sometimes all at the same table. In my memory, this restaurant was warm and inviting and it was exciting too. And the good news is that it, it still exists. It's still here in Tucson. When it came to restaurants, my grandparents were very different. For the most part, they just didn't go out to eat very much. One exception uh, was on Friday afternoons when they would go to Furs Cafeteria. <laughs> At Furs, my grandparents could fill their trays for $4.99. <laughs> when they would take my brother and I, it was just an additional $2.99 for all we could eat. <laughs> we piled our plastic trays with fried okra, garden salad, chopped steak, mashed potatoes, macaroni and cheese, corn off the cob, fried chicken, coleslaw, and green beans. Of course, there was also jello in every color. <laughs> At some point, they even installed a machine that produced soft serve ice cream. There in the dining hall, we would go back over and over. Like clockwork, my grandfather would set the plates before him. Then he would reach into his shirt pocket to pull out a single jalapeno or a yellow hot chili. It was usually wrapped in plastic and he'd unfold it and take a first bite before he started eating his first dinner. If he forgot his chili at home, which happened on a couple of occasions, he would leave the dining room, he'd get back in his truck, he'd drive back to 42 North Melrose to retrieve the chili he had forgotten. Then he would come back to his booth seat at Furs where his food was waiting for him. There were several locations of Furs in Tucson, but my grandparents only went to one, the one that was located at 1095 West St. Mary's Road, right next to Bonita Avenue. It's just steps away from the Santa Cruz River and just a short distance from another place that they used to take us all the time, um, the place where there are statues, uh, a place where there is reverence, uh, a place where there is faith right at the river. This location was the last furs to survive in Tucson, and it actually only closed a few years ago in 2017. In a post-pandemic world, it is hard for some of us to imagine the closing of a chain serving very bland food to be any big loss at all. But the truth is there was a community of Tucsonans in the barrio, many of them elderly, who lamented the closing of this food hub. More than the food the employees and the regular customers at Furs Cafeteria spent hours every week together. Those relationships were real and meaningful, and when the doors were closed, there was a real reason to mourn the loss. 
Like many Tucsonans, one side of my family lives in California. Though my Calexico and San Diego cousins didn't visit Tucson often in the summer, when they came anywhere near the summertime here in Tucson, they'd often use the heat as an excuse to pack everyone together in the car and drive to another important family place for us, the Raspado shop. The one we went to the most often was Tony's place. It was owned by Mary Pacheco. This five by five foot hut stood in a row of houses on West 29th Street near I-10. It was opened in 1957 by Mary Pacheco's father who had sold candy in Mexico. And then when he came to Tucson, of course, he had to sell uh, snow cones. He knew obviously that ice was a very, very good thing to sell in the desert. Because Tony's was open late, even open past 9 p.m. in the summer, uh, we often went there long after the sun had set and then the flavors of sweet cinnamon milk, strawberry, pineapple, watermelon, took us into a kind of summer night bliss. My California cousins called them raspados, but Tucsonenses have a different vocabulary, <laughs> of course, and so we call them cimaronas. The late Jim Griffith wrote about Cimaronas in 2013, he said, these are a favorite Tucson summer treat and were available on the west and southwest sides long before any ice cream stores had moved in. They are correctly called in Spanish raspados everywhere but in Tucson. Locally, for some unknown reason, their name is Cimaronas, which also means female mountain goat. <laughs> He says, don't ask me why. If you have the answer, please let me know. He writes, I have a fond memory of serious arguments with an out-of-state press that was publishing a Tucson recipe. Its Spanish language expert refused to accept the word cimarrona as a legitimate word for raspado. Um, Jim Griffith explains that he had to call on a chorus of elderly witnesses, including the late Lalo Guerrero himself, to prove that Cimarrona was a genuine name for this summer treat. It's a word that by itself kept Tucson from being Texas or California. If there was one thing that my family wished was a little more like California and Tucson, it was access to fresh seafood, of course. Thank God for us. We are just four hours away from the Sea of Cortes because life without the sea in Tucson wouldn't be the same, of course, at all. In my Tucson food map, there are oysters, lots of oysters, dozens and dozens of oysters. And I think about oysters, um, it makes me happy to think about oysters. Sometimes on the way home from working at El Rapido, my father would make a pit stop at a seafood truck that was guaranteed to lift our spirits after a long work day. I remember the one that was parked on the corner of Grande and Congress, where my brother, my father and I would always share one large cocktail de camarón. For me, what filled that 16 ounce styrofoam cup was worth its weight in gold. They serve ceviche, fish tacos, cocteles, and best of all, the oysters. These mobile restaurants were called carretillas, and they moved from carport to public city lot every day in most of South Tucson. In the mid 1990s, before food trucks were cool, the Pima County Consumer Health and Food Safety once estimated that more than 149 licensed vehicles that operated as carretillas uh, were existing in throughout Tucson. In the Tucson of my memory, there is food in many open lots, just like the carretillas would park um, in fields of dirt and gravel. These were places where you can't see a formal kitchen, but you can see fire, you can see water, and you can see the ice chest filled with all kinds of ingredients. Perhaps the most sacred of these open air places on my food map is the Mission San Javier. 
Wheat uh, is, of course, considered an old world crop that was brought to Sonora. Though the idea of wheat cultivated in an indigenous so-called new world um, is a controversial topic, there was not much controversy in our family when it came to visiting the fry bread stands here uh, Sunday mornings at the Mission San Javier. Over time, I've begun to investigate better to better understand the effects of wheat um, in this part of the world, um, the effects of this kind of colonization on our food waste, how it affects our culture, how it affects our relationships, and of course, how it affects our health. It's not an easy topic to address. And in my book manuscript, I've started to think about what that really means. I've only scratched the surface. I haven't found any answers yet. But I would like to share a passage from my book with you that's about uh, the popovers at San Javier. My father puts Ricky and me in the truck and drives us out to the reservation a few miles south of our home. On the drive, we see the bright white plaster of San Javier de Ba mission punch through the woodland of mesquite trees and push against gray mountains and blue sky. We park in the dirt lot and drag our feet over grail walk, gravel walkways up to the church founded by the Jesuit missionary Padre Eusebio Quino. Made of piled stone and mud, the mission's bell towers rise up like siblings, one done and one undone. The taller tower is do domed and plastered white, making its place in the desert almost like an inverted exclamation point. My father points at the mission's facade and retells the same ancient tale. You see that cat and mouse, he says, not really asking. I can't see it, I say. Where, Ricky asks. Open your eyes, my father badgers. He points a crooked finger at the elaborate carved mud plaster. His heavy hand lands on the crown of our heads to force our gaze up, up, higher, Eventually, we find the sculptural details, a skinny cat, an elusive mouse emerging from the Baroque background. When the cat catches the mouse, the world will end, he says, resigned like a prophet. How's it going to catch the mouse, Ricky asks, loud and suspicious. There is never a clear answer. All that seems to matter to my father is the story itself, the words repeated like an incantation in front of the mission. When we step inside the vestibule, my father dips fingers into a bowl of holy water and makes the sign of the cross on his forehead, his heart, and his shoulders. And Ricky and I repeat after him. This is baptism. My head tilts back as we walk in further, and I stumble on the uneven floors. We walk deeper into the mission, making even our footsteps as quiet as we can. In the mortuary chapel, Ricky and I kneel and repeat our memorized lines. My father gives us coins to place in the collection box so we can light a candle to add to the glow of the sanctuary. I light my candle, and Ricky lights his. Then we watch the flames glow among the rest, making light in the darkness of the shrine. Only then are we cleansed from the sin of skipping Sunday Mass. <laughs> this is reconciliation. I look to the statue of the Virgen, her palms facing up into the blue hue of the Nicho engulfing her. I say something, a Hail Mary. I try not to think about whether or not she hears me. I wonder instead if she's asleep with her eyes open. I think if I were her, I'd get tired listening to all of these repetitions. Still, I like coming to the mission. I like going through these clunky and absent-minded steps, mostly because I already know they will be sealed with a meal at the fry bread's tents. Other people call them fry bread, but my father calls them popovers. In front of the mission, the people who make them call themselves the tohono o otam. My father is often demanding of servers in restaurants in Tucson, but he acts differently with the ladies who stand all morning long, 
wrapped in aprons, their hands waving over cauldrons of oil, their palms turning dough over and over. They say Padre Quino was the one to bring the wheat, both a blessing and a curse, here to the desert people. Either way, my father couldn't be happier. We walk away from the cat and mouse and come to the edge of the open dirt lot where the expectation of fry bread is the only thing keeping my father from chatting with everyone. In line for popovers, he is eager, but more restrained. He's even quiet. What he awaits, sorry, what he waits for is something very valuable. The dough bubbling and glistening gold is sanctified. When it finally arrives warm in his hands, he takes a bite, then he passes the plate to me, and I eat. I pass it to Ricky, and he eats. Holding the bread to our lips, we are anointed by honey, slinking down our fingers down to our elbows. This is communion. It happens every weekend. Popovers consecrated in honey or powdered sugar or chili colorado nest in their paper plates in front of the mission. This is holy ground where the city meets the reservation and there is transfiguration dotted with the round and bubbled faces of fry bread. This is worship. I learned slowly, but in my memory, my father drives us out to the mission over and over. We repeat this ritual many times until eventually the thought of popovers becomes a direct message to me, a story. In the story, there is sacrifice, but it isn't mine. In this story, there is blood. There are thorns and tears painted on the walls and carved in those rocks, but it is a story I forget, too. Under the saguaro-ribbed ramada at the mission, I begin to feel unstable on those gravel rocks. Just when I think I know what I am, who I am, and where I come from, the ground in Tucson shifts again. I stare at my half-eaten popover, and I squeeze it tight so the wind doesn't take it away. I want to thank you again uh, for having me here today. I'm very grateful to share these uh, tender food memories, and I want to encourage everyone to think about how they would also share their memories. Write them down if you have to. When you do, I think you'll find um, something kind of chemical changes in us. It's not just a psychological thing, I think, that happens when we write our food stories. Um, I think it's something that uh, I've experienced over years of writing um, my book, my memoir, and it's a physical response um, that we have when we share all of our food stories. Our tongue starts to tingle. I've definitely had that. Um, I've had my mouth water while I was writing, of course. And I think if we collect our Tucson food stories, uh, I'm pretty convinced that we will be drawn to creating a future Tucson uh, that continues to be geared towards these things that Thomas Sheridan wrote about in his book, Los Tucsonense, this idea that we would be geared towards subsistence rather than commercial exploitation and expansion. Um, as was mentioned, my book is going to be out in fall 2024. It's called The Molino, um, and I hope it's an opportunity to connect again with you all and share some more stories. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Millie. I think we have some um, time for uh, questions. If you'd like to field them, if you have a question, just raise your hand and uh, or a comment, and I can come around and um, give you the microphone. Well, I have one to start it off. Mm -hmm. um, what do you? Th what are your thoughts on the um, current Tucson food landscape? You know, now that we're a city of gastronomy and have a lot of recognition for that, can yeah. you just offer some ideas about that? Thoughts? Yes, there's a lot packed in there. <laughs> Yeah, city gastronomy. Obviously, as many, I think probably most cities that have any kind of designation, there's some good and bad that we take with that. Um, I don't know all of the ramifications of, of being designated a city of gastronomy, um, but I know that it brings attention. 
And attention means um, sometimes people want to love what we're doing. And sometimes it means that people want to come in and get something out of what we're doing. So I know we have to be very, very careful of that. Um, I think it's kind of hard for me to imagine now what, uh, what Tucson food landscape looks like because I'm still mentally a little bit in the pandemic in terms of food being served uh, in restaurants and that kind of thing. I know we've we've moved a great deal from that, um, but my family changed. My, fam my immediate family's um, practices in terms of food has changed a great deal. So uh, I'm just starting to go out and look at what's happening in, in Tucson right now in terms of food. Generally speaking, I always wanna go to the same places. Yeah. Any other any questions? Yeah. I so miss your father's cooking. Oh yeah. Is there any chance there may be an event in the future where it can be tasted? Yeah. Again? Um Dad was actually cooking a great deal even after El Rapido closed. Um some of you might know that he started working in the casino, in the in the restaurants in the casino. Um and he got super popular at Casino del Sol for a tortilla soup that he made. Uh, it went viral when things were going viral, I guess. In that way. Um, but he doesn't cook a lot anymore. He was actually doing um, a lot of um, catering as well, which is, you know, part of his heart for sure, because his great grandfather did many, many catering jobs along with having the food store um, catering for some of the biggest uh, Tucson uh, businesses that he could, right? I think Tucson Electric Company was one of, um, or Tucson TEP was one of the ones that he used to do huge parties for. Um, but my dad uh, is, is an older man now <laughs> and he likes to do things his way. And um, he also is doesn't have his hearing anymore, so he looks at it at a much in a much different way. And the last time I convinced him to cook for the public was a reading I did in 2019 um, as part of a, a grant that I had earned, um, a, a grant that I was awarded, and that was amazing. It was amazing to have him cook again, but even Christmas. I'm the one making the tamales now. He's not doing it anymore. I think he's kind of done. I think he's resting from that. Yeah. I wish we had the flavor back, though. If I had one of his pots, maybe I could do it kind of like he does. Yeah. I have a um, close friend who's a Tucson photo uh, photographer who lived in the corner market uh, at Meyer and Franklin for many years in uh, starting in the 70s. Mm. And he has very fond me memories of um you know getting going for to lunch at uh el rapido for sure yeah does for takeout <laughs> yeah i think a lot of people um recognize my dad when they see him my dad is out all the time he's an elderly man but he doesn't stay home <laughs> he's everywhere so if you see him um you need to say hello to him you need to probably remind him of who you are <laughs> um and you need to speak clearly and enunciate nicely so he can hear what you're saying. He gets very excited to meet people that he knows used to go to El Rapido, but I think um, because memory is fading a little bit, it, it is helpful if you tell him, even if you saw him every week for 15 years, you got to remind him who you are. Other questions or comments? Um, where's a good seafood restaurant? in tucson <laughs> <laughs> i really like the truck that's on uh 22nd and 6th las palomas or something yeah. palmas palomas one of those that one is amazing yes <laughs> that one back here just a second <clears throat> as a newcomer to tucson in the 70s my first exposure to Mexican food was something called the chimichanga. And and now I don't really hear about it. Is there a history to the chimichanga or well there's a rumor. Okay, that's that even Tucson that Tucson invented the chimichanga. I don't think other places like that rumor. <laughs> but there's definitely a rumor that it was started here. Um it's it's an interesting story to think about how uh 
we want to make claim to certain food items, right? Um, it's not that the chimichanga doesn't exist in a bunch of other places. It's I think it's the word, right? Who came up with this idea of chimichangas? My dad actually never made those, never sold them out of his store. But for catering events, he made mini chimichangas. <laughs> you remember mini chimichangas, right? Um, so it's it's certainly part of Tucson identity that I think Tucsonans would like to claim as as a Tucson food item. Yeah. It's it's a little bit like the um, the quesadilla, which I've always been told was invented in Imoris, uh -huh. uh, you know, a bit south of the border here. Which you know, I mean, people <laughs> putting two tortilla or cheese between two tortillas and melting it. <laughs> yeah. It's pretty certain that that probably happened in a lot of places at the same time. <laughs> I think my dad um, had a few customers who did not ever order um, quesadillas, but they ordered buttered tortillas, which for some of us is even better. <laughs> Other questions, comments? Oh, Diana. Thank you. That was a really beautiful talk. I really enjoyed it. Um, when you were, uh, we were talking about sort of food ways that Tucson owns. Um, I wanted to ask about Sonoran hot dogs. Um, I was expecting maybe they'd <laughs> pop up in your talk. Um, do you have thoughts about <laughs> the Sonoran hot dogs? <laughs> what an amazing question, right? To be in a lecture on university campus and have someone say, do you have thoughts about the Sonoran hot dog? <laughs> That's a great question. Um, I really wish, I, I, could, I mean, not wish, I guess I don't wish. I think I know that I could uh, deliver this lecture for like three more hours to go through all of those places. I had a long list that I sadly had to leave behind. Um, and for sure, um, the Sonoran hot dog is part of that. It's such an amazing mix up, right? And that's what... Um, Actually, I have a, a dear friend, a flamenco friend, who last weekend uh, gave a talk and I was listening to her. She said, all, all culture is hybrid. I love that. I think it's absolutely true. All culture is hybrid. I'm very, very proud to be hybrid myself. I'm mestiza. And so any food that reflects mestizaje, you can't go wrong. I think it's I think it's a beautiful, beautiful thing. I don't do it very often, get the sonar hot dog, but there's some times when you crave. I also wish I could have put Pat's chili dogs, which was before the sonar. <laughs> so if you haven't been to Pat's chili dogs, you haven't been to Tucson yet, right? <laughs> yeah, that's another one that's really important. Thank you for that question. Yeah, sonar hot dog is a, a culinary commitment for sure. <laughs> Uh, other questions or comments? Okay, well, before we break here, I just want to remind everyone that we have a reception out on the patio here in this um, beautiful courtyard um, that is actually still dripping with rain from last night. Uh, and I just want to say, Mele, thank you so much for your beautiful presentation, your beautiful words, all your work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.